The early years of the new millennium witnessed the greatest investment in the Irish rail network since railways first came to Ireland over 170 years ago. A complete transformation, a sort of renaissance, has taken place right across the network and is set to continue well into the future. New tracks, trains, stations, signalling, rolling stock, all have undergone a massive overhaul, bringing the railways out of decades of neglect and into line with 21st century expectations. An idea that the early pioneers of railways could only have dreamed of. In a way, railways are becoming fashionable again. Over the next three weeks, this series will look at how, once upon a time, rail mania ripped the nation and enjoyed a golden age, followed by a long period of decline before being revived once again. This series will also look at how rail travel in Ireland can develop far into the future. Railways in Ireland have been around for a very long time, almost 180 years. And when they first arrived, they brought Ireland to the forefront of technological change and played a major part in connecting the cities and remote towns right across the country. Historically, um, they came to be built after the era of the canals. And of course, they, they wiped out the, the traffic on the canals when, they got, when the railways got established. Uh, at the time, roads were in a very primitive state across the country, so the, the railway could bring you to uh, location fast. Probably 40 miles an hour was a, uh, an enormous speed in, in, in those days. Uh, it could also bring heavy goods to various localities, and it, it transformed the economy of Ireland. Can you imagine it in rural Ireland with uh, huge organizations of men uh, digging the earth, creating tunnels, creating viaducts? Uh, just the very infrastructure itself was, was unimaginable across uh, rural Ireland. And then the train uh, puffing, puffing smoke and steam and the noise and travelling at, at an unimaginable speed. It, it, uh, it must have been like, I don't know what, uh, the Sputnik or, or um, the first aeroplanes. It must have been even more than that. Having once enjoyed a golden age, Railways then entered a long period of decline and underinvestment. But today, a revival is being championed once again. I mean, we've had railways in Ireland since 1834, and um, that's a, a, a long, long time. Um, unfortunately, most of the network is gone. Um, certainly, uh, the, the very extensive network that went tentacles stretching all over the country uh, has been whittled down to s just the main lines. Towards the end of the last century, an exception to decades of rail neglect was the dart. As the 8 o'clock Bray to Hoth train pulled out of Daly Station in Bray this morning, CIE officials were describing DART as the most significant development in Irish railways this century. There were many who were quick to predict the failure of this new initiative. But the DART has been a big success and has proven that when commuters need to get from the suburbs into and out of the city, the train is still their best bet. 35,000 people use the limited service, an increase in passenger traffic of 50%. Because of that, six extra trains have been arranged for tomorrow morning. A spokesman said people were voting with their seats. 
Well, the DART was very important, I think, in the Dublin context because it was the first electrified uh, rail service that we, we've had. And in fact, it's still the only one. Uh, all of the mainline rail uh, services are, are diesel. Um, they used to be steam, of course, but that was a long time ago. Um, so we have an electric railway line in, in the DART, and that uh, uh, carries a, an awful lot of people into and out of Dublin every day. The arrival of the DART in Dublin in 1984 took place exactly 150 years after the launch of Ireland's first railway, the Dublin to Kingstown, or Dunleary as it is known today, a bustling suburb in South County Dublin. And still the DART travels along much the same route that Ireland's first rail commuters used. It's coincidental that the, the DART was launched in 1984, which as it turned out, was the 150th anniversary of the Dublin and Kingston in 1834. And um, this was the first suburban railway in the world and when, it, when it was built. Ireland's first railway was launched to great excitement in 1834 and, like the dart today, proved very popular. When the Dublin and Kingston opened, it was an instant success carried a huge number of people. There were uh, big dividends to the promoters. So a kind of railway mania began. Small Ireland was at the cutting edge of, of railways in those days. Much of the Dublin to Kingstown's early success was due to a sizable resident population that lived along the line. And as the coastal route was developed further and the population continued to increase over successive decades, this evolving population provided a healthy number of passengers for the railway, and this has ensured its survival today. Following the success of Ireland's first railway, other new lines were developed, first to Belfast and thereafter the rest of the country. Investors decided that rail services should extend to where, at that time, most of the population lived, the far reaches of the country, west of Dublin. Kingsbridge was built as the terminus for the Great Southern Western Railway, with the ambition of extending railways to the entire southwest and west of the country. At Lucan in 1845, the first sod was ceremoniously cut by the Duke of Leinster, an event that prompted one bystander to say that he could now die happy, having seen a duke work like a common workman. Thereafter, Ireland's railways began a journey out from Dublin to the rest of the country that was to have a profound effect on people and communities across the land. By the mid-1860s, Dublin was effectively connected to most cities and, uh, and towns across the country. The expansion continued because railways made sense. Uh, they they uh, brought people and goods with unimaginable speeds. Uh, and uh, relatively comfortably uh, to their destination. The, the railways were an integral part of the, uh, the then Irish economy, um, carrying people and goods all over the country. And for a good deal of that, the railways made money, or at least in the central parts, there may have been some peripheral areas where uh, they didn't make economic sense. Um, it, it was a, a, a boon to the country. It allowed agricultural produce to be brought from the farms of, of rural Ireland to the ports and exported. Having achieved its goal, railways were to cover Ireland from north to south and from east to west so that by the end of the 19th century, most remote areas had access and railways became an integral part of everyday life. It did its job very well. It delivered people and it delivered goods and 
cattle and fowl and messages, etc., etc., etc. It was a vital community link along the West Coast. Then it died when people stopped using it with the advent of the motor car. But the important thing is that a lot of the line had the idea of linking western towns still exists. The golden age of the railway continued up to just about the, the First World War. The effects of the First World War were decisive on the railways, on the railways all over the world as it happens, because the internal combustion engine was developed to a new level of sophistication. And after, after that war, then uh, cars, buses, trucks came on the roads. Over the next decades, the, the um, railway began to, to um, suffer from competition from the road. Uh, in Ireland, the railways began to lose money, uh, quite apart from the effect of the Civil War uh, in 1922-23, when uh, lots of the railway was blown up, um, hundreds of bridges, trains were derailed, stations were, were destroyed. The rail system, ironing the land, was really a wonderful 19th century product of the Industrial Revolution. And to be able to deliver thousands of people in a straight line from A to B, it was quite revolutionary in its day. And the railways right across the developed world had a growth period until after the Second World War. The Second World War saw the mass development of the motor car. The golden age of the railway in Ireland was at its end. The new revolution in transport was to take hold and continued for several decades after the formation of CIE in 1945. People fell so in love with the motor car, they put pressure on governments, again through the political establishments, to build more and more roads, more and more spaghetti junctions, more and more autobahn, autostrada, right across the developed world and people got very fond of their car and in this small island they got so fond of their motor car that they abandoned the railways. After the Second World War, I suppose, Ireland was in an economic backwater as well and uh, when uh, CIE was formed, the government wanted it to reduce its losses which plainly was not possible. And uh, so uh, the, the stasis continued and the, the problems of, of little money being spent on the railway conti continued. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, renewed efforts were made to hold the rail network together. In the 1960s, you quite some amusing marketing campaigns. You had the musical expresses, the singing hostesses, you had the Killarney specials, you had the shopping specials from the provinces to Dublin. The railways got a little bit of revival because they were in tune with the times and they began to reach out to their customers uh, with some success. Good morning everybody and welcome to the radio train to Killarney. Lord Connor Jassy here to welcome you aboard to tell you something about our trip and the country through which we'll pass. We pass through Verdon countryside, we see a country with 40 ships. By the late 1990s, the love affair with a car had turned sour. Congestion in cities and towns across the country brought transport issues to the forefront of national debate and put public transport concerns back on the map. Ireland's road infrastructure, always favoured over rail, was also lagging well behind that of Europe. More and more people looked for alternatives and the car, once the most serious threat to rail travel, looked like it was putting railways back on track. The defects that, it, that in terms of public policy, um, road versus rail, has been there for a long, long time. 
roads have always got more, mo more money than the railways. Um, um, I mean, since the time of Todd Andrews and the closure of the Harker Street railway line and various other rail lines around the country uh, in the uh, late 1950s and early 1960s, um, the vast bulk of transport investment has gone into roads rather than railways. So that, you know, the railways were always playing second fiddle in terms of investment. So a very stark choice faced the government in 1997 that they just had to invest in at least improving safety, if not speed, uh, on the rail network. The railways, which had suffered five decades of neglect with little or no investment, put their case to government. I suppose the commuter services are the most important, um, particularly in Dublin, uh, because they carry you know, large numbers of people to, to and from their places of work. And we are living in a very sprawled city. So that means that, you know, uh, commuting, long distance commuting has become part of the lives of a, an awful lot of people. Uh, where you have a commuter belt that stretches out, you know, uh, up to 100 kilometres. So rail obviously has a major role in that, even though the vast majority of people still commute by car. Uh, it is really important that a rail service is provided as an alternative. The success of the DART and some newly refurbished intercity services showed that travel-weary commuters would consider alternatives and that the railway could be an attractive option to road transport. Many commuters started to consider rail to avoid hours of gridlock. The creation of the DART gave a fillip to the morale of the railway managerial culture. I mean, they showed that they could create a completely new commuter system and do it well. And in fact, as is well established by now, there were the, na the naysayers. There were the people who said, this will never work. Nobody will take it up. They won't get out of their motor cars. Well, it proved once again, if you offer people an efficient, comfortable service, they will do it. They will take it up. The DART system catapulted us out of the third world uh, r railway system and to some degree uh, across the country. It showed you what real investment could do in the railway. The newly launched Enterprise service, running between Dublin and Belfast, became another success story. But the Dart and the Enterprise were exceptions. Most of the railway services throughout Ireland were still in poor condition. Throughout the 80s and 90s, little or no investment went into Ireland's railways, resulting in a serious deterioration of track, signalling, rolling stock and standards of service. The need for investment was obvious, but that need to invest would have to become a must need to invest. And the state of the railway was soon catapulted to the top of the political agenda. Let's not forget that it was driven in the first instance by the knock rockery accident that took place and which made it very plain that if the government didn't invest in improving the safety of the railway network, such as we have, we have it, uh, that it would be presiding over an unsafe railway. And that could not be countenanced really by any minister. The 8.25 morning train from Dublin had just travelled to the railway crossing at Curry outside Nacrockery when the derailment occurred. It was shortly after half past ten and the 180 passengers on board were more than halfway home. It took till 1997 when you had a, a derailment in Nacrockery which is north of Athlone and uh, that brought the, um, the poor situation of the railway around the country into, into harsh light because a, a passenger train was derailed due to degraded assets, poor track, um, 
luckily nobody was injured. But it's, it so happened that it was in the, close to the political area of Mrs. Mary O'Rourke, who was Minister of Transport at the time. And um, various studies were commissioned on the safety of the railways. And they found that uh, some of the track, particularly in the West, uh, some of the rails were over 100 years old. And uh, a couple of years later, a major safety programme was brought in where there was um, relaying with modern, continuous welded track all over the country at an unprecedented pace. Um, and that really opened up other investment which, which followed, uh, I suppose, uh, taking advantage of support from the European Union. Uh, then uh, a myriad of other improvements in the railways uh, took place over the, the late 90s into the 21st century, it included new rolling stock, uh, improvements to stations, improvements to signalling and many other areas. After government acknowledged the need to invest, making the case for the railways couldn't have been better timed. Ireland was experiencing huge economic growth, and a benign Europe smiled. No one could have predicted the economic turnaround. Ireland was becoming affluent. to deliver a 21st century rail service was huge. After five decades of underinvestment, the railway was now expected to provide an infrastructure and service, and quickly, if it was to provide a real alternative. The daily commute in and out of our cities had become, for many, unfeasible, and commuters were being forced, literally, into the refuge of rail cars. It seemed that the railway's time had come, and it would have to catch up fast. On next week's programme, we look at the growth of Ireland's railways during the economy's boom years, and how railways responded to the pressures of prosperity. By the late 1990s, Ireland was becoming affluent, and the pressure of this newfound prosperity on the country's railways were enormous. Railways, which had suffered decades of neglect, were expected to deliver quality services to commuters, many of whom were struggling with a daily commute on the roads. But Ireland's railway was catching up, and now the motor car, which, ironically, had once caused the decline of the railway, was helping it to get back on track. Both road and rail were about to enter a period of dramatic change.
at the heart of national planning, there was a failure to predict prosperity. Once you get prosperity, you get increased pressures on all kinds of services, on roads, on hospitals, on schools, and on the railways. A general malaise of failure was in the Irish psyche for many, many generations. Suddenly prosperity comes, and people find it very difficult to cope and to predict. While government realised the need to invest in railways and made a commitment to do so, it was apparent that the road lobby were destined to receive the Tiger share of the investment and that railways once again would have another bridge to cross. Roads have always got more, more money than the railways. There was, I think, an inbuilt um, vested interest in this country in building motorways. Um, because um, there was so much money to be made out of them and we had all the resources that we needed to do it ourselves. And so the much promised transformation of rail infrastructure from the ground up had begun. The first of its kind since railways first came to Ireland and a welcome respite for those who had struggled to keep the rail network together for so long. The people who were here in the kind of early to mid-90s uh, were heroic in many ways because they were keeping the show going on uh, meagre funds, both in terms of day-to-day -day operation and in terms of, of capital investment. There really wasn't any uh, major capital investment outside very specific projects. So uh, in the face of increasing demands from, from customers and indeed from uh, people around the country, be it communities, be it politicians, looking for this improvement, that improvement, there were a lot of good intentions to try to deliver that, but unfortunately there wasn't any funding provided to do it. And uh, they were, I suppose, the generation that really kept the thing going uh, through sheer graft, uh, without the support that they would have looked at their counterparts in Europe and elsewhere, uh, and said, if only we had uh, some of that, uh, what, what we could deliver. Where to invest, what to invest in, expansion of the current system, the development of new lines, the reopening of old ones, new life for the regions, the planning of new rail corridors, new rolling stock and brighter, modern looking trains, decay and decline about to be reversed. A renaissance for the railway? Perhaps. But what were the real priorities for renewal of the railways going forward? By the late 1990s, the government in Ireland had, had realised that uh, some big decisions had to be taken with the rail network. Either the rail network was to be retained and developed and enhanced, and if it was to be, then significant investment was going to be necessary, or perhaps a more negative decision to withdraw from some of the network. But fortunately, the decision was taken to retain the rail network and to develop and enhance and modernise the rail network. And that, by the late 90s and by the year 2000, a substantial programme of, uh, of renewal of the basic infrastructure of the railway had been announced. The work that had commenced by 2003 uh, was work that was absolutely essential, renewal of the track, renewal of the signalling systems, but not necessarily work that was visible uh, to the day-to-day -day passengers on the trains on the railway. We needed new trains, we needed to enhance uh, our stations, we needed to improve the accessibility of our network. It was a, you know, a very exciting time, a very challenging time as well when the investment came through for the people who had to deliver that because uh, the, the, the expectation was created and uh, in the early years with the track and signalling it wasn't very visible investment but then when the trains started to come through and the frequency improvements came through, uh, people saw, well this is where uh, my euro is going, this is where, uh, be it what I'm paying in fares or what I'm paying in taxes, uh, this is the benefit uh, that I'm getting. We've renewed our rolling stock fleets right across our network, Dart, the commuter lines, 
and the intercity services. Indeed, we moved um, from having one of the oldest fleets of any European rail network uh, in a very few years to having one of the most modern fleets anywhere in Europe. And it was a great opportunity for us to demonstrate to people that our railway was going through a real resurgence, a renaissance of the rail, which would bring people back uh, to using the rail on, on, on a regular basis. We will shortly be arriving at You've got a fleet of trains that are absolutely fit for purpose, that are you know, really of a good quality standard on board in terms of comfort. I and mean, then you've got then things like the frequency, the hourly service. The railways were coming of age. Investment was flowing and the much promised transformation had begun. The first of its kind in over a century. An opportunity to reconnect Ireland's towns, cities, and to address some of the transport imbalance that had existed for too long. I think a lot of the, I mean, the investment that has taken place in the last uh, 10 to 15 years has been tremendous, really. Um, it, it's given us these sleek modern trains. Uh, that's the most visible evidence of it. Uh, the number of, of trains is much larger, uh, the length of the trains is much longer, uh, there, there's more and more people using it all the time. Outside of Dublin, Cork, the capital of the south, remains the most viable route serving both cities. Hourly services run along the newly upgraded former Great Southern and Western Line, with new connections via Limerick to Ennis and Galway. Cork also has commuter services to and from Mallow and spur lines feeding out to Cove and a new line to Middleton. When Cork was first reached in October 1849, the journey from Dublin took six hours and it had six terminal stations. Now the journey takes two and a half hours on average. Historically, the railway in Cork had a remarkable impact. It helped to stimulate trade and movement. And with the invention of large steamers, the railways funneled down most of the emigration in the second half of the 19th century to what was then known as Queenstown, now Cove, one of the major departure points from Ireland. Had it not been for the railways, many thousands would arguably have died of starvation at home and wouldn't have made it to the new world. Had it not been for the Industrial Revolution, they might not have had the ships to take them there or made new lives in industrialized America. The great contradiction was that the new technology of the 19th century did not enable the feeding of those starving back home in Ireland. But railways alone cannot develop economies. Railways can only facilitate development as long as other inputs for local industry are already in place. Today, Cove serves a substantial population along the line into and out of Cork City.
after Cork was reached in the latter part of the 19th century, the next big destination was to the capital of Connacht, to forge a railway through the Midlands to Athlone and across the Shannon to Athenry and Galway. In June 1846, construction began at Broadstone in North Dublin and was developed. The line to Athlone was completed ahead of schedule in 1847. Despite the famine that was ravaging the western seaboard, the building of a line in such difficult times gave employment and stimulated the local economy. This led to a boon for the livestock industry in the Midlands. But for the west of Ireland, it was mostly people, not cattle, that were being exported. But despite the famine and the difficult economic times, the investors in the new railway presented an image of unshakable. Many routes were abandoned. A century later, during the 1950s, Ireland suffered a fresh wave of emigration and the population was reduced again. Rail development outside of Dublin has always been a test of government commitment to regional growth and expectations. The once vibrant Western Rail Corridor from Limerick to Sligo provided a passenger, mail and freight service between regional cities and towns and to outlying areas along the Atlantic coast. The West Clare Railway became legendary, as you know, because of a song. And it was a different time. It was a different era in this country and Percy French wrote a song. which eventually killed the railway, some people said, because it wasn't regarded as a means of transport anymore, it was regarded as a, as a comical experience to travel on it. But nonetheless, it did its job, and it did its job very well. It, it was a vital community link along the West Coast. The idea of a Western rail corridor seems self-evident, but there is this extraordinary gap between the East Coast political establishment and the needs of the West. There's nothing new about it. It's been there for many years. John Healy wrote a book about the death of a Western town called Nobody Cried Stop. It seems to be endemic in the East Coast culture that the West is a foreign country. As far back as 1894, it was possible to travel from Sligo to Limerick by train. However, as the railway went into serious decline, so too did the rail corridors that ran up along the west of Ireland. The Western Rail Corridor and its potential for development has, it seems, been finally acknowledged and a new service links Limerick to Ennis and Galway. But so far, the numbers using the service have been less than predicted. Erin Road Erin has not done itself a huge favour in terms of the service that is already being provided between, um, between Ennis and Athenry. I mean, train speeds, are, again, are slow. 
um, you could uh, uh, easily beat the train on the bus or in a car, and you know you and passenger numbers as a result have been much lower than expected. The figures for the first year are around 250,000 people used the Limerick to Galway service. That's not enough, but I would argue that what we have at the minute is half of the Western Rail Corridor. Until such time as the next phase, which would bring it to tune, is in place, you will not see the real advantages in Galway. Until such time as on the existing phase, you have the station in Orne Moor in particular, which is a huge commuting area. You will, I think, see a huge upsurge in people who will avoid all of the roundabouts or want to avoid all of the roundabouts coming into Galway who can get a train service that brings them right into the middle of Air Square. And once that starts early enough in the morning and finishes late enough in the evening, I think you're going to see a huge growth in numbers by that alone. As of now, we have phase one of the Western Rail Corridor in place. Uh, we have succeeded in connecting Galway and Limerick. Obviously, the next phases of the Western Rail Corridor will be very important in terms of the whole regional development issue. We have had a national spatial strategy in Ireland now for uh, quite some number, uh, number of years. We have had the notion of balanced regional development, and we've had the notion of front-loading infrastructure. To a certain extent, these have all been uh, widely supported concepts, but they've only been given lip service. And the test now will be for the government to follow through on the work that has been done here and to build their corridor to Chum and to Clare Morris in the next instance. There is a difference between running an economy and a country. And on an economy, you have to justify the figures. This is about running a country. It's about a spatial strategy. It's about connectivity for the West, the same as for the East. Not everything comes down to pounds, shillings and pence. I accept there has to be an economic argument. I would argue there is an economic case to be made for a rail corridor up through the west of Ireland. But we will only know that when it's put back in place. For too long, uh, there has been a perception in Ireland that the railway company and the railways are a drag on the economy. Or that the subvention, as it's called, that's given to railways is in some way something foolish. Nothing could be further from the truth. In actual fact, it behoves any developing democratic country to support the notion of public transport and to invest taxpayers' money in public transport. And even if public transport requires a subvention, I contend that that's what people pay their taxes for. We pay our taxes so that we can have these services. Politicians react to numbers. If there's a groundswell out there that wants this, and if Western Track and all of the other proponents of this want to make this happen, they need to get more public opinion and more backing behind them. It's part of the education of the public generally to use public transport, but in this particular case, it's to show that the demand is there, that people are willing to use this. And it's very important that we look not at the present, but at the future. We're talking about 10, 20, 30, 50 years time. And I contend that when this railway is open to Clare Morris and ultimately to Sligo, that people will look back and say, is it possible that there were people who could not see that this was a sensible thing to do? I think the Western Rail Corridor is, is really a fantasy. Um, I mean, there's no way that it's ever going to happen. And the reason for that uh, is partly due to the lack of density of population, but also to do with the fact that um, ultimately um, between Clare Morris and Sligo, there's something like 200 level crossings on, on that line. So there's just no way that that can be reinstated. And I think people in the west of Ireland have got, just got to face up to that reality, uh, that it isn't going to happen. In my opinion, it may not even happen beyond Athlon Rye. So if, if the first phase of it, you know, between, of the reinstatement of the Western Rail Corridor between Ennis and Athlon Rye hasn't worked out um, uh, very well, then how can they and anyone expect that the rest of it is going to work, work out? Future development of the Western Rail Corridor beyond Galway is for now an aspiration on hold. As Ireland deals with recession, the dream of a Western Rail Corridor is unlikely for now.
Next week, we look at some of the big spend rail projects under consideration. Currently on hold due to recession, projects such as line speed improvements, Dart Underground, Metro North, and a Dart linked Dublin Airport. All of which could further transform the future of rail travel in Ireland. Railways in Ireland have come a long way, and their recent revival is now providing real travel options for the country's commuters. Of course, the quality of road transport has improved dramatically too. The train and the private car have been rivals since the combustion engine first appeared. So, perhaps it's now time to leave that rivalry behind and to consider instead a more holistic view of Ireland's transport needs. A number of proposed big spend projects, such as Metro North and Dart Underground, which are currently on hold, and further planned extensions to the Lewis, leave the future development of Ireland's transport systems open to question. What's important, however, is that the country continues to invest in its public transport structure, so that if the economy does eventually improve, Ireland can provide genuine public transport alternatives and not be over-dependent on its roads. With 40% of Ireland's population living in Dublin, it's not surprising that priority for new rail projects is given to the capital, which requires efficient mobility into and out of its centre. One such project, the recently completed Kildare Route project, is already impacting on intercity journey times and commuter efficiencies into and out of Dublin. The Kildare Route project is essentially an increase in track capacity between Hazelhack Station and Cherry Orchard, a distance of some 12 to 13 kilometres. Prior to the project, there was a double line, one the up line to into Dublin and the down line out of Dublin. And the Kildare Route project delivered a doubling of that track capacity. So we now have two lines into Dublin and two lines out of Dublin. One of the main benefits of the additional tracks are there is greater flexibility. In other words, prior to the project, if we had a breakdown in one of the lines, all services behind that line had to stop. Whereas now with the forward tracking, we have two up and two down and it gives much greater flexibility, much more ability to run services when we do have a problem or an issue, and obviously in the longer term, much increased capacity. The Kildare Route project is also helping to ease line congestion into Dublin. 
but much more is required if intercity journey times are to be reduced and railways can persuade commuters to leave their cars. I would use uh, the, the rail service at least uh, once a month uh, to travel in to different parts of Ireland. I mean, the trains look better, but they don't run fast enough. I mean, that's the basic problem. Uh, and they're being outbid, really, by the motorways at this stage. And people are making those choices on a daily basis. And unless train speeds can improve, the situation will only deteriorate over time. People can make journeys by private car now much quicker, uh, in complete safety on, on the motorways, uh, than they used to be able to do. So we've got to improve our competitive edge. Uh, we have got to make our intercity journey times quicker. The new trains we purchased uh, have good high-speed potential, uh, but we need to reduce some of the places where our track is speed-restricted. There are uh, a number of places across the state uh, where, we can't, uh, where the train can't travel at its full potential because the track is speed-restricted for various reasons, and we need to uh, carry out further infrastructure work to get over that. We're determined to do that. Uh, we're determined to ensure that you can get by train uh, to, from the capital, to and from the capital, from any of the major cities of the state, uh, within about two hours. And uh, that, that, that'll be a good target, I believe, to give us a competitive edge again uh, over the private car. Perhaps the greatest symbol, if not the only symbol we have of the Celtic Tiger era is the new Galway to Dublin motorway, which means that you get from one end to the other in two hours. That obviously has repercussions for public transport because if you can get there quicker by road, it disincentivizes the, the, the need for public transport or the desire to take public transport. But it's to emphasize, I guess, the facilities that are there, the fact that you get work done, the fact that you can have something to eat, the fact the comfort and the lack of stress from being on public transport, that that is the key to all of this. It's one of the difficulties I would have with taking a train. I have two children, I'm married with two children. The price for four people, two adults and two children, to go on a train makes it cheaper for me to go by car. If I'm going on my own, I would use the train on a very regular basis because that makes economic sense. So you must make it as price competitive as you possibly can. If we can get that message across, the combination of having a service on your doorstep, having a competitive pricing, price service on your doorstep, and having the possibility of getting tax back as a result of using a competitive service on your doorstep, all of those things together make this work. However, speed remains a key issue. Well, I think that uh, Erno Dern have put forward a very valid case to spend, um, I think, 275 million, um, a, a relatively modest sum, which is less than a third of the cost of the M3 motorway uh, between Blanchestown and, and, and the outskirts of um, Kells uh, to improve train speeds. And that would be the, I think, the single most important investment that could be made at this stage. When buses first appeared in Ireland, they were seen as another threat to the railways. Private bus operators had to apply for licenses, have their fares approved, and publish their schedules so that bus services would not conflict with train schedules. When this proved unworkable, most bus services were amalgamated into the newly formed CIE, who bought them up and ran them themselves. Timetables were coordinated for both road and rail. Today, the improvement in the quality of Ireland's motorways means that intercity bus services are freely competing with intercity train services on much the same routes. And, like the private motor car, those buses are putting more pressure on the railway to compete. Lewis, Dublin's modern urban tram system, provides a link from the city's outer suburbs into its centre. Lewis also provides a link to and from intercity train services at Houston Station and Connolly Station in the heart of the city, connecting mainline rail into Dublin's DART and commuter network. 
Lewis is set to expand its service to Bloombridge in North Dublin and may yet provide an interchange with suburban rail, bus and future projects such as Metro North and Dart Underground. And with a further extension in the future, Lewis may even provide a rail-based link to and from Dublin Airport. Unlike most other capital cities across Europe, Dublin's airport is still without a mainline or suburban rail link into the central rail commuter network. One might think that a major catchment area, almost the size of a small city, handling in the region of 19 million passengers a year, would be prioritised for such a service. The thing that has never been considered and ought to be um, is uh, to the possibility of diverting the Dublin-Belfast railway line through the airport. Um, because that would not only uh, um, free up the, the northern line to Balbriggan and so on and Drogheda uh, for commuter trains, you know, and take away that conflict that exists at the moment between the enterprise service to Belfast and the commuter services. Uh, but it would also provide um, a, a rail link to the airport from the city centre. Uh, and, and it would also facilitate an awful lot of people in Belfast who uh, use Dublin Airport. I think the problem with this one is uh, one of cost. You're creating a, a very substantial piece of new railway infrastructure that costs money, but also south of the airport you're coming through the northern suburbs and that would involve substantial tunnelling. Now that line would also meet up with the Minute line uh, and that's the way it would access the city centre. And there were always concerns, well, that there would be conflicts there in terms of capacity and so on as well. So primarily on cost grounds, I think that has been, has not uh, really progressed as a, as, a, as a project. Another of those proposed big spend projects, Metro North, could potentially make a link between Dublin city centre and North Dublin via the airport. Most capital cities do have some sort of rail access from the airport and uh, providing that to the, the, the tourist and foreign traveller I think is, is a huge benefit of, of, of Metro North. Metro North is linking, is providing a link between North County Dublin, effectively from Swords, via the airport to the city centre, and it links up there with the Lewis Green line at, at Stevens Green. So it's providing, if you like, uh, benefits for the long distance, more long distance commuter from North County Dublin, um, airport users, and then uh, for commuters in the northern inner city area. But I suppose another key benefit of Metro North is access to the airport. And the, if you think of the airport, as a major generator of economic activity. Um, not only in terms of the employment there, I think in the environs of the airport, the employment may be about 12,000 people at the moment. But the sheer volume of passengers moving through the airport, now at perhaps I think around 19 million or so. And that's not to mention all the, if you like, the other uh, people who use the airport to, to meet and greet relatives and all of that sort of thing. So if you look at the airport, you have to say it's like a fairly large sized town in the Irish context. And surely that should be linked, you know, into the transport system in a more substantial way than it is at the moment. Uh, whether in the short term through a dark based link or in the long term through, through Metro North. We know for a fact that the far, foreign tourists or foreign travellers coming into a strange airport are much more likely to take a rail-based mode of travel than a bus-based mode or a taxi mode. Uh, it's, that has been proven the world over. But whatever rail-based connection succeeds in linking the airport to the city and suburbs, Metro North has had much criticism. Metro North was the daftest project um, to emerge during the, the, the boom period. Um, you know, it, it was superficially saleable in the sense that it seemed to suggest that Dublin was going to have a metro, you know, like so many other cities do, 
Um, you know, and yes, of course, you know, it's wonderful to be able to travel around uh, on the Paris Metro or the London Underground or the New York City subway or whatever. Um, but, you know, Dublin is a sprawl city. Metro North would not have done anything to serve the sprawl city that we have. It would have involved providing a, railway, a, a, a rail link between St. Stephen's Green and um, um, somewhere to the north of Swords, a, a distance of about 16 and a half kilometres for something of the order of four billion and effectively would have amounted to simply putting um, a Lewis line um, uh, underground for a lot of that length. I think 10 kilometres of the 16 or 17 kilometres of the line was underground. So, you know, to me, it, it didn't make any sense. Plus, the cost of installing it in terms of its impact in the centre of Dublin would have been horrific and I think would have been completely unacceptable to the public if they understood the consequences, which, include, which would have included the... Um, uh, turning of a, the entire northwestern quadrant of St. Stephen's Green into a huge hole in the ground um, would have involved removing all of the statues and monuments in O'Connell Street uh, and, you know, taking them down and putting them back up again and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, how a project like that that would have had such a limited impact in, ter in, it, in transportation terms could have got beyond the starting gates is just a mystery to me. In the absence of either a main line or metro link, a proposal to connect Dublin Airport by rail into the existing DART network at Clon Griffin Station in North Dublin is being considered as a low-cost solution. And so I think this um, proposal for a DART link to the airport has come up in the context of Metro North being postponed for a considerable period of time. Uh, and against that background, it looks like a very attractive project to me um, in the sense that it's providing a link to the existing DART system and through that through, to a wider network um, for a very low level of capital cost. I think the, it's been estimated to be a, of the order of 200 million euros or so. And the reason for that is, of course, that it's connecting the existing DART line to the airport through what essentially is a greenfield situation. So the cost of construction and so on are likely to be low. I think the other, obviously, it, uh, uh, the other benefit in, 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 in relation to it is simple access from, from the domestic, uh, domestic population to the airport via a public transport link, a fixed public transport link. Ongoing improvements to rail transport provides the country with genuine travel alternatives. But there remains a missing link in the jigsaw for commuting services, which, when realised, will transform rail transport in the Dublin area. There are many transport initiatives planned for the Dublin area. I suppose the the dark underground is, is uh, one of the biggest. Uh, it certainly sounds promising on the basis that it would, in, in one step, it would, uh, you would be able to increase the, the DART uh, network by three times. DART underground is regarded by most commentators as the missing piece of Dublin's rail jigsaw. It would, if completed, connect the Cork intercity line right through to the northern intercity line to Belfast. Starting at Inchicore, a twin tunnel, one for each line, will go underground to Houston Station. There, it will travel south of the River Liffey to a new station at Christchurch. From Christchurch, it will go to St. Stephen's Green, where there will be an interchange with the Lewis and potentially the Metro North system, should that project ever proceed. The next stop would be at Pierce Station in the heart of Dublin, which would form part of a major interchange between the underground dart and the surface dart. This interchange will allow commuters to come directly into Dublin city centre without having to change transport modes, enabling commuters to connect with the surface or underground DART service.
The Dart underground tunnels would continue from Pierce Station into the Dockland Station, rising to surface and connecting into the Northern Line to Belfast and with Lewis. People don't like the idea in Ireland of changing trains on their daily commute at the moment because it's the network of now. Whereas if you were in uh, London, you don't think of changing trains because you know how frequent those services are. That's what Dart Underground uh, can give us. It can make it a situation where if you are living within the catchment of all of the various lines, that you are brought into this network of, of high frequency services and that is really a no-brainer. It's just what you do. It's about giving the city and the region and the country a network, uh, the type which that they expect in other cities. We can have that here and, and that's what Dart Underground is really about. The Dart Underground project is the most vital piece of infrastructure that's, that, that's needed in Dublin because it is the missing link between the existing suburban services because that would not only alleviate the congestion at Connolly Station but also uh, knit the train services that we have in, in Dublin. Uh, both the DART and uh, the ordinary commuter rail services into a network. Um, and that's something that really is, should be a priority. The problem is, of course, that we don't have the money to do it now. We may have the money to do it sometime later after we've stopped bailing out the banks. While many of the proposed big spend projects are on hold now, it's maybe timely to reflect again on Ireland's real transport requirements for now and into the future. Even the pure economists will tell you that this is the time that you should make investment for two reasons. Firstly, when the good times do return, you're in a position to hit the ground running and take full advantage of that. The second reason is in the bad times, it means that you have employment for people in projects of serious magnitude, and that has to be good for the economy. For Ireland Inc, we need uh, good connections all over the country, and if Dublin is to become a, a true capital which will attract in multinationals. We need good mobility around the city. When we look at other European countries, such as Finland or Switzerland or any of these countries, we see that it's a priority in all of these countries to have a good quality rail system. Thinking people in every country in the world can see the value of rail. And there are plenty of thinking people in Ireland as well. But there has been a tradition of apologising for railways, which we need to get away from. We need governments to become imaginative. We need governments to be proud of their achievements in rail. And we need them to take on the notion, once and for all, that they are going to promote the concept of railways. I think the, the Irish public uh, should be happy with their ra railways. Uh, uh, they can travel most parts of the country now on a high quality train service at pretty good speeds and in uh, comfortable trains and uh, I believe pr pretty reliable as well. Uh, it, uh, it has been quite a sea change from how it was two decades ago. Today we owe much to those early pioneers who laid the first tracks out to Kingstown over 170 years ago. They were part of something that had a profound impact on Irish life. The latest development of Ireland's railways continues that legacy, proving that good, targeted investment in public transport can have many far-reaching effects for the country and for its travelling public. Ultimately, the future impact of railways depend on the decisions we make now, 
informed by the kind of society we want for generations to come.